Um, and then I'm going to go to Facebook Live. Okay. And I'm going to do it. One question with copyright things. If I show a book cover, is that an issue? Not an issue. As long as I'm not showing the content of the book. No. Yes, that's fine. If you're not okay. saying, I made this book, <laughs> I should be yeah. fine. Uh, uh, if you read a couple of pages from it, it depends on how long you take from it. It becomes copyrighted over, but you're fine. No, I'm just going to show the picture of the book. Right. Okay. Hang on. Um, I, I'm just trying to do all the things. Well, can you whoever is host give the audience permission to record so I can have a copy on my computer? I am going to, hang on, hang on. I'm trying to write all these things. Um, hand out. Uh, I think I have the ability to, but I'm, I'm recording it right now and I'm going to put it on YouTube and I will okay. do it. So it's live now-ish. <laughs> so. Yes. <laughs> all right. Also, do I have permissions for screen share? I think so, because I've never turned it off. <laughs> okay. Uh, all participants can share. All the fun stuff for the beginning as we're live already. Check the, I don't remember how I can check the recording part. It has to be done in your settings. I think I did, but I'm going to record it. So I'll, I'll have it up like tonight. Your, your drive, because I can see the red bot at the top. So yeah. it should be fine. Okay. Okay, go, yay. <laughs> okay. So, hello, I am Dame Calandra from the Kingdom of the Golden Plains, and I'm going to talk about finger weaving. And she's now that's a, what? Oh. And she's the current regent. <laughs> I'm just, yes, yeah, so I'm the regent of the mean? Golden Plains. I'm just trying uh, to pump you up, right? Just deal with it. <laughs> yeah. And I've known Alona for over 20 years. So, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> uh, finger weaving is a term that you may not be familiar with an amp card, but you've definitely seen it. The majority of the belts that are made with parachute cord and macrame cord are done with a technique called finger weaving. And it is actually a very ancient method of weaving. And I'm going to go into some different weaving terms first to start with. And I realize I'm having my camera is shaking. I'm sorry. Okay. So some basic things to understand with weaving is the threads that you weave with are called the weft. And the threads that are usually attached to say a loom are called the warp. Well, in finger weaving, your warp and weft are gonna be the same thing. We're not gonna use an external device called a shuttle filled with yarn to weave through our warp threads. We're gonna use our warp to weave with. And we'll demonstrate that here in a moment. Now, finger weaving actually is period in medieval. It, there are some, some references that it can be found in many cultures around the world. Most of the time we hear about it at, in relation to Native Americans. Now, the majority of the pre-1700 Native American weaving was actually a form called oblique. Now, normally when you look at the finger weaving and you see the tutorials, they'll say you shouldn't be able to see the, the thread you're weaving with. Well, the oblique, you actually do. And if you look at some of the Cherokee oblique sashes, you'll see where they use beads to accent and they'll still put diamond shapes in there, but you do see both the warp and weft evenly and it is more of an even weave. It's just a matter, of the basic things we're defining finger weaving is that you're using simple materials, you don't need a loom and your warp and weft are the same thing. You, there's also a lot of evidence that can be found in Peru in South America. The Peruvian cross rep weave is actually one that we see a lot in Amtgard. Uh, maybe a little hard to see this one because it's green and white, but that is actually based off of a Peruvian weave. There's also a thing called finger loop braiding that we don't really see in Amtgard very much, but it's very common in SCA. And it's a form of use loops in your fingers to manipulate to make different designs and patterns. Well, you can do flat weaves with that that look identical to finger weaving. And my theory is that some of the things that have been identified as finger loop braiding may actually be finger weaving. The chevron and diamond patterns are common that you can find uh, around all around the world. You can find it in 
in history with Turkish Ottoman Empire. All right, they would find the fine things on the caftans that held the held the caftans closed that were sometimes they were woven finger loop braiding and sometimes with finger weaving and would use fine silk threads. So finger weaving goes way beyond just macrame cord and parachute cord. There's a lot more out there that you can look at. I do recommend looking at the book Finger Weaving Indian Braiding by Alta R. Turner. There are other books out there. Uh, this one is just usually a good one to find. And it does discuss also the Peruvian rep braiding in as well and has a lot of different designs. Now, before we go into the actual weaving, I do want to bring up something that this has been a concern with some people about cultural appropriation. Well, finger weaving is not exclusive to Native Americans, but there are a few designs that are. The lightning bolts and the arrowheads, those are purely Native American. They are not found anywhere else that we've been able to find evidence of. I personally may use those for personal use, but I don't sell them. This is your own thing to think about in relation to that. But diamonds and chevrons and diagonals, those are found in many different forms of weaving because in many different cultures around the world, and they are not exclusive to one culture. Just to think about that. Because there's also uh, some of the Japanese braiding, uh, not just kumihino, but some of the ones that are done on the, on the square looms are actually done in a similar, form similar patterns to what we're going to do with the finger weaving also. So many different ways to get the same the same look, but they're very similar. Now, is there anybody that is wanting to follow along? Because that's going to affect how I do this. Okay, so if you're not going to follow along, then I'm going to go into the setup. I'm going to switch the camera here. Actually, first I'm going to do a share screen. I'm going to show you some different weaves. So let me do that. Just going to take a moment to get it to the right place. There we go. Okay, so we're going to look at some different styles and different things that we can do. Once I get to where I can move things. Okay, so this one's a good starting point to look at. So the basic way that we're going to start with is the diagonal, which is what this green and orange one is on the side. And then there are different variants that you can do, which I'm going to explain as we go through, because these are just variants of the diagonal just by manipulating the threads or arranging them in different orders. This is a diamond, which the chevron is going to be the basic thing we're going to start with to show how to get to a diamond. And this is expanding from there. But these diamonds, the orange and black and over, are just different variations of that. And then we go back to a diagonal again, just with larger threads. So you can do simple things. You can also get fancy. This is actually my favorite one with the doing the diamonds. And you can vary your diamonds, as you see, by deciding which threads you're going to go all the way over and br or bring just partially in. You can create different patterns with that. And then you can create double diamonds, too. This is two chevron pattern or patterns set up next to each other. And so they end up forming a third one in the middle as you go through. And this was woven with four millimeter macrame cord. If you are, do want to try something that's a double wide, I recommend two millimeter or four millimeter. Six millimeter will be too wide and too thick. The four was pushing it. That is a really wide belt. But you can also weave with yarn. Now this is the lightning bolt pattern that I mentioned. This one is a very complex weave. I'm not gonna go into that one tonight, but that one can be found in the book that I was recommending. And this is done with cotton yarn. And this shows also that you don't have to attach things to a ring. You can do a tied sash and make fringe on the end of your belts. So there's just 
a world beyond just the just the plain cord uh, on there. And I will admit, I don't use parachute cord. That's just my personal thing that I don't like to work with it, but I know a lot of people do. Uh, just wasn't really a thing that was around much when I was weaving most of my belts. There's just some other variations. There's a there's a plain chevron. Now we're going to get into class. How do awesome. you do this? Oh, everyone that's not Calandra, can you please mute yourself, please? So it'll get feedback. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so let's switch to switch cameras. So I'm going to demonstrate with yarn. I realize it may be a little dark to see, but hopefully we can get this worked out. Now I had some set up and I set up a thing where you could, if you wanted to try it with yarn of how you could do this. I'm just going to show some small samples of things. And we're going to weave a little bit here. Now, if you were wanting to make a belt, there are some different theories on how you want to do the cord. Most people will do three times their waist measurement plus maybe another foot after that. Some will say two and a half times your waist. And it just varies. I personally, if I'm doing a diagonal belt, will make each cord about 16 feet long. For most people, that's gonna be fine. For my husband who is six foot seven and not, not a small person at all. Uh, for him, I have to do each cord length being about usually about 19 feet for him. So just accordingly. But when I would sell belts, I would do pretty much about 16. Now 16 feet for each one. If it's a chevron or a diamond, you do need to add extra length because some of the cords have to go back more than others. And so I may do generally about maybe 18 feet for each one if I'm doing a chevron or a diamond. But you can play around and see what works for you. If you're a smaller person, uh, you know, you may be able to get way small with using less cord. If you're a larger person, you may have to use more on that. For reference, I am five foot two. Okay. So the basics with finger weaving is you need something to weave with, yarn, and something to anchor your weaving to. Now the popular thing in Amtgard is you tie your cord onto a ring and you anchor it to your toe to start off with. Not everybody's able to do that or, or it's not convenient to do that. So you can take your ring and you can tie that to a doorknob or a table or something that's a sturdy fixed thing. I have at many times used clothing racks when I was selling things or uh, anchoring to a post at the park if you have a pavilion that you're using. Uh, some other things you can do is you can get a C-clamp. You can tie it to that. Uh, you, For more stability, you could take two C-clamps and put a dowel rod in between it and anchor it to that. Uh, if you're using yarn or silk threads, you can use a clipboard or safety pin it to your shoe or something like that. The book uh, recommends safety pinning things to a pillow. I know personally I could not do that because I would rip the pillow because I use too much tension. I am using my ankle loom. Uh, now I do have it tied directly on. Most of the time you're not going to try tie things directly onto your anchor point. If I wanted to, the side comes off so I can slip things off. But you could tie things onto a dowel rod. Which I have an example of that. Once I get it untangled, well, it's a mess. But you could tie it onto a dowel rod and then tie the dowel rod to your anchor point. Same with your ring, tying that onto something instead of wrapping your ring directly around something. Because you are going to be creating the tension by holding things. So it's kind of like a variation of a backstrap loom, if you've ever seen of that, where you have one, one point is tied to you and one point is tied to a fixed object. But we want to, with finger weaving, we need to leave the ends open because you're going to be weaving with your, with your warp threads, as we discussed. 
So I have this set up as a diagonal pattern. And the first thing you want to do is tie your cords onto whatever it is that you're doing. So if you're using a ring to make a belt, then you're generally, when I say you wanted your cords to be, say, 18 feet long, you're going to end up folding that one cord in half. And you're going to attach it to your ring with what's called a lark's head knot. So I have my ends folded in half, I made, and I have the little loop here. So I'm going to lay the loop over the ring and then take the ends and I'm going to pull them through the loop and that attaches the ring. Now, if you're using a dowel rod and you're wanting to leave uh, room for fringe, make sure to leave at least six inches on the end on each end to be able to add your fringe, to be able to make fringe. You could tie it onto the dowel rod with a lark's head, just leaving one end smaller than the other, which I did here. You can make a over, couple overhand knots, or you can just tie with one overhand knot. Let me demonstrate an overhand knot. So the overhand knot is just simply wrapping it over the top of the dowel rod. And then I'm going to take the short end across it under the big one and pull it back up over through the loop and just pull that tight. Now see how it comes off like that. What you would do if you're going to do just an overhand knot, because you're going to intend to do fringe, once you have all your ends tied, then you can take all of them and either use an external cord to tie them together or make a big giant knot together with all your ends and then tie that to your anchor point. The, doing those simple knots will make it easy when you slide, you can slide out the dowel rod, you can easily undo those knots if you just do a simple one overhand or a lark's head. So with this basic setup for drawing a diagonal, you can actually do a lot of different patterns. And, and how you arrange your cords is going to affect how your patterns form. Some pattern theory with weaving is that two, color, two cords of the same color next to each other form a solid line. So if you have two of A together and then two of B, you're going to get a solid line of A and a solid line of B. And when I talk about a cord, if you folded your cord in half, we're talking about each end of the cord. So if you took had one pink, say this was a folded in half one, then these two together are going to form the solid line. But say if I had, I alternated and I have color A and color B next to each other, then that's going to make a split line. And so if you had two of color A, and then one of color B, and then two of color A, you're going to end up with a dashed line in the middle. Such as here. Now this is ankle woven, but you can actually do similar things with this type of weaving and similar how you might set up something for ankle weaving and how you get the different shapes and patterns. You can do that with finger weaving, but a lot of times it's going to be, you can do it, set up a diagonal to get some of those patterns. It's just going to be diagonal instead of straight up and down. So getting started here. I leave, I weave left to right, but you can weave whichever way is more comfortable for you. You just want to always start the same direction because if you alternate directions, you're actually going to create some different patterns. So when we're starting out, I like to hold my yarn with one hand a little bit down here. And then I have the other hand free. We're not going to pull the ends all the way up. We're going to just manipulate up at the top. It's a lot easier than trying to bring the ends up. So in weaving, you have your basic over and under. So I like to start going over usually. So I'm going to go over the first cord here. 
Then I'm going to go under the next one and then over. Now, right now, I'm not trying to pull it tight. I'm trying to leave it a little bit loose so you can see what I'm doing. And we're just going to go all the way across, alternating going over and under. So that one's over and then under. The trick here is going to be when we go for the second round, what you do with this cord. So when I got to the end, I pulled this one out and I'm going to pull that close to the top here. I'm going to worry about tension more on the, the next one. So on the previous row, I had started by going over. And in regular weaving, when you're, if say you're weaving on a pot loom or doing a tapestry, you would alternate starting over or under. But in this one, because your, your warp is shifting each one, you're not necessarily, you're not going to alternate. So since I'm pretty much going to start by, I'm going to go over again and then under. And as we go across, I'll show what we do with the cord on the end, because that one's going to get incorporated into the weaving here. See right now, you, I can see my thread from the previous row. As we work in, work it more, we're going to pull this tighter so that you don't see that. Okay, so we get to the end, and I've got this one from the previous row. That, in this case, for this one, since it would be the next one that I would go over, I'm going to pull it under the one I was weaving with. So now it's part of the weaving. And then we pull that tight. And so you just, for the diagonal, you just repeat this process over and over again until you have it to where you want it to be. So you just go over and under. You had to worry about your tension a little bit. I am actually pulling this. I'm going to pull that up close there. Now, as you go, you want to watch and make sure that your ends, your, your sides are even. That one's not pulling in more than the other. That's something that comes with some practice sometimes or manipulating the cords. The cords you work with, some of them are easier to pull tighter than others. Now, the diagonal, you really do want to pull it pretty tight. I'm going to show with the chevron in a moment that that one is a balance. So if, sometimes if you pull it too tight, then it will distort your weave. But if you don't have it tight enough, then the loops will pull up and you can see your weaving thread and you don't want that. So some variations that you can do, if I kept going with this, you would see that it would start forming a diagonal. If you wanted to form a gentle arch or curve, you can change the direction that you were weaving. So I was starting on the left and going to the right. Well, my next one, I'm going to go to the right, or start on the right to weave to the left. And that's how you can form an arch. I don't have a picture of when I've done that before, but I have woven a belt where it made it look like tie-dye a little bit. I've also done a full rainbow belt with using the arch. So some fun things that you can do with that. Now, one thing about when you do the arches and the diamonds, you are going to get kind of a little, little bulge a little bit on the edge of the belt, which you may have seen on some of the diamonds that I was showing. And that's just natural with how this works because of how you're changing the direction. You see how this is where you have to watch the tension because if I pull this too tight here, it's pulling this in. And so I want to work that out to try to keep it to where my edges are even. And so just some fun things that you can do with that. Now, if you wanted to do some variations with this setup, once you have your cords on, and now if you're using yarn, you can 
manually set it up this way. If you're using double over cord, you'll have to manipulate things at the start. That if you wanted to switch how your cords are, let me try to see this one. This one might be easier to show on that. Let's get that. on. Okay, well that's not going to stay very well. But with my doubled over cords here, if I, and I realize these are dark. So you have a solid cord next one cord of one color and then a cord of another color. You can switch them around at the beginning. So now I've got one purple and green next to each other and then another purple green next to each other. And I'm gonna think of these as their pair, their pairs together. And so that's how you get some of the different variations is what I was talking about where you have color A, color B, and then color A, color B. And you can do that by just moving their cords around at the top of your ring. So now we go to the chevron. I do recommend trying the diagonal weave before you try the chevron. Get some practice with tension. The chevron is definitely a balancing act when it comes to tension. Now this is going to be similar to how some people may have seen friendship bracelets. <clears throat> Which friendship bracelets are a good thing, good reference for patterns. A lot of those have are knotted, but instead of knotting, you would weave it and you can alternate that easily for some things. I do like to start in the center, but you can start from the outside. Which direction you start from with a chevron will determine which direction the chevron goes. So starting on the outside is going to go a different direction than starting on the inside. So you start, you're going to think of this as kind of like two belts that just meet in the middle. Something that may be helpful if you have a lot of cords or you're trying to do a double one. Some people do like to use uh, clips to hold one side of the weaving. Uh, you can use bag clips, clothes pins, binder clips, uh, something that's easy to, to hold on to. So I'm going to start by crossing one thread over the other and I'm going to do my over and under all the way across on one side of my chevron. And at the moment I'm just going to work on leaving that there. Now I'm going to go to my other side. Now this is the trick is making sure that you go the right direction when you go to the other side. So since this thread was under that first one, it's going to go over on this other side. So we're just going to repeat that over and under going across here. Now you can see my threads there at the beginning. As I work a few more rows, we're going to get it to where you shouldn't be able to see that pink thread. But right now we're just trying to find the balance. So in that first row, we were over and under. So we're going to do that again, crossing over and under. Now, if you do make a mistake, it's pretty easy to undo it and it happens a lot. A lot of times you can tell if you've gone the wrong direction. If you move your cord, see so these cords from the two rows here should not touch each other. But if you can move them to where they touch each other for the ones that you're weaving with, then you know you've woven the wrong way and you just undo it. 
So here I'm starting to try to work on my work on my tension a little bit. And that's how I'm trying to keep it at the angle because if you try to push the threads all the way up to the top, you're going to distort your pattern. The other tricky part with a chevron is making sure that you're starting with the right cords when you're in the center, which is why it's also helpful, you know, for some people like to use the clips so that they're only holding one side at a time. But I like to hold both sides as much as I can. Because for me, it does help with the tension. But if you start doing a double chevron, then you're going to want something to hold the other cords out of the way. See, I should be able to see there's starting to be a little bit of a V that's warming here. So I'm going to do one more row on this, and then I'm going to demonstrate what to do for a diamond. We're going to use the same setup to do the diamond because the diamond weaves all start with a chevron. Which is your V. Do when you have a second. Yes. Uh, okay, so I have some questions. Uh, direct it was direct messages to me. So is cord one used with cord two? Is what? <laughs> they might have to explain. <laughs> and I don't know who it is because they're just iPhone two. <laughs> uh, how about this? Please show the close up top of top. So like okay. do it closer up. Yeah, there we go. And then they say, so on the first pattern, you work cord one across and then you work cord two across at the end. Do you work cord one under cord two? So row three would be cord L3 from the right? Wow, I'm very- Yes, confused. so with, a, with each time you weave across, the cord that you wove with gets incorporated into your weave. So it's like everything is shifting over one. Okay. So in the first row of the diagonal or the second row of the diagonal, the cord one, the cord one that you were weaving with in the first row becomes the last cord of row two. And then with row three, the last cord of row two become or the cord you wove with row two becomes the last cord of row three. I think that's what that was asking there. Yeah. Okay. And there's on the handout, there is a link to a site that has a diagram picture directions for finger weaving. And that one really illustrates it because they show, they don't show it being pulled tight. They show it being loose. So you can see the, how it shifts over one each row that you weave. And that one, you can also follow the links to find directions for Chevron as well. Okay, I've uh, I've repasted. Oh, hang on, I gotta do it to everybody. Oh, oh my jeez. Hang on. Uh, let me redo the thing. Uh, I'm resending the class handout for everybody, and uh, and then Casey St. Clair, who uh, I know designed the Amp Guard logo because I put it on things and your name's on it. That's really awesome. Tried this weave once with paracord, but the middle got super tight and wrapped. I think I must have pulled it too tight. That is a big thing is a lot of people are so used to you have to pull it tight, pull it tight. But the chevron, you don't want to pull it super tight. You've, it takes practice and balance to find to where you're getting your cords hidden, but not losing the weave and distorting it. Because sometimes with this one, if you pull it too tight, you're actually going to see your cords. And it's going to, which can form an interesting pattern in itself, but it's not necessarily what you're looking for. See, I'm kind of playing with this one right now so that I can get things hidden. Usually the first row, you may still, first couple rows, you may still see your, your warp threads in there. And, but as you go, it should be less noticeable and to be able to get the, the balance right on it. So we have a few rows starting the chevron. Normally I would weave more. Usually I weave a full set 
of the pattern before I start a diamond. But for the sake of the class, we're going to start doing the diamond now. So this is kind of like how we change directions with the diagonal and started doing the arch. For a diamond, you're going to start weaving from the opposite direction that you had been weaving. So I started in the center before. For this round, I'm going to start on the outside and weave to the inside. Now my cords are still going to meet in the middle. And see, I did make a mistake there. I know. This is where you really start to see if you <laughs> did make a mistake. I'm just being vocal. I'm just reading out the chat because you are weaving and not looking at the screen. Um, so I have, I guess anyone can answer this if they're familiar with finger weaving. Can you get these wide enough for sashes or is it that reserved for other weaving techniques? You can weave, it's easy to weave a two inch wide sash. Yeah. That's simple, um, especially with cord because most, most of the belts that people weave are about two inches wide. And I think if you're using six millimeter macrame cord, seven cords across, I think comes out to about two inches on diagonal. Uh, four millimeter, you would need more. Uh, it's been a while since I've done that uh, things. Now yarn, you would be looking at a whole lot of yarn. And see, as I said, we make mistakes and I made a mistake that I have to try to fix. <laughs> So I'm going to go fix that. Because yarn likes to twist, and so it's easy to get it to miss something somewhere. OK, so now I fixed it. Now I can go back and do what I'm supposed to do. Because part of what I need to do when I'm switching my directions is since this one was over the last cord, it's going to have to go under that one now so that I get it in the right way. And I didn't do that. But it's still over and under and alternating as you get through. So there's my middle. So now I'm going to weave from the other side. Now, some fun things you can do is with this you could actually weave holes into your belt if you wanted to do that for a design. You could weave because you could weave one section independently for a few rounds and then do the other side that way, like do a couple diagonals and then have them join again in the middle. That could create some interesting effects. Okay, so now we're in the center. So this one is under, and this one is over a cord. So my one on the right is going to go over. See, I, have my, I actually have a hole here because I didn't cross them over on my last round. And now I'm going to weave from the outside in again. And this is where you ha have a lot of artistic license of how you want to create your patterns. Because even in the same belt with this, how things are set up, there are so many variations that you could choose to do with the diamonds. Because you don't have to weave, you know, all of one section to one side. I mean, you don't have to start with the same colors that you weave in each time. You know, I could decide that, okay, I'm going to get to where the pink's on the outside and then weave the pink in. And then may decide that, okay, for another one, I'm going to try weaving the blue to the outside and then have the blue come in to start a pattern. Um, I didn't do a close up on it, but one of the pictures I was showing, I showed a one that was a ribbon. And that was, that's a very, by doing the pink ribbon, that one uh, also, you know, for a fish pattern, that one is a variation of the diamond. I just did a diamond and then a half of a diamond for the next one. And that's something you just really have to play with and, you know, try different things and see what happens. Part of creating things is experimenting. You are not going to be perfect on your first try of anything. 
an important lesson to learn. You just have to keep going and see what works for you. What works for one person may not work for another person. I have been weaving in some form or another since like probably for over 30 years. I've been doing finger weaving. I started Amtgard in 2001. I started finger weaving in 2002 and I wove and sold belts for about 10 years. I don't do a lot of finger weaving anymore, but I do a lot of ankle weaving and I also do tablet weaving and tapestry weaving. And so I'm always playing with tension and crocheting and knitting and anything fiber related. Yeah, uh, I would say that if our university that we went to actually had some kind of degree in it, you would be a fiber, like textile degree. You. Unfortunately, they got rid of the fiber program before we started, which is why there were looms filled in the basement of the art building. So what you're saying is we should go there and take them. I see. They already sold them off, unfortunately. But anyways, so as I've been sitting here playing with it, as watching that I'm manually trying to adjust things. One of the ways to help with tension is take your fingers and pull things down. That helps. Is it hold it where you learn to hold things where you need to? For me, it's just kind of a natural thing at this point that I know where I want to hold things. But as I said, it how you hold it may be different. I have issues with my wrist and tendonitis, so I do tend to hold things differently than most people do. You can see I have my hole here because I forgot to cross over my cords in the middle. But you know, we weave a hole. I do have some messages from iPhone too, and I don't know if I caught, I didn't catch them close enough. Uh, I don't think they understand that they understand pattern one will slant left to right. And if so, when do you weave right to left? I don't know that this person needs to speak up because I don't understand your questions. <laughs> okay, so the diagonal, you can either choose to weave left to right, or you can weave right to left whichever one you prefer to do, whichever direction you want it to go. If you, but you can also make, what I was showing where I changed directions creates a curve, it'll create, create an arch. And when you want to start that, if you're wanting to start an arch, it's up to you as far as where you want that to start. Oftentimes what I will do is I will weave one full pattern of the diagonal. You'll know that you've gotten to the pattern when you get back to the beginning that the cord that you started, the very cord you started with from the beginning is on the left again. When it's, and that's how you know you've woven through one full pattern. That's a good starting point if you wanted to make an arch to start going from the other direction. But really, there are no rules of when you want to start things. It's try it, see what it looks like. If you don't like it, unweave it and try again and just keep going. And then Pix said that they had a whole set of woven macrame sashes that they did in 2019. And the patron asked for D rings in the middle of the weave so they could attach any enchantment strips and then send the link. So you should totally look at this when you're done talking. Uh, and then uh, Covina wants to rescue the looms from college, um, but they're gone. So we have to build a time machine. It's, that's, that's it. Yes, it was sad uh, with the looms being when they got rid of those, but they did at least donate one to the library that some woman would come in and weave on periodically. So we go to that library. All right, Western Illinois <laughs> University, we're going to do it. We're going to. Who knows it. if it's still there? That was a long, long time ago. Hey, anyways, I think the so, library policeman. <laughs> so when you're Don't weaving, you. you know, sometimes you want to take a break and you want to walk away. But if you leave things, just leave things like this. If you're using yarn, it may stay, but you're going to lose some of your tension. If you're using some of the cords, like parachute cord, it's going to fall apart. So what you can do, if I'm doing a chevron or diamond, I, I do two knots. I, do, I treat each end as their own separate thing. So I will do a loose overhand knot. So I'm going to make a loop and I'm going to pull I'm going to grab the threads, but I'm not going to pull them all the way through. I'm just going to do pull up enough that I can pull this tight a little bit. And I missed a thread. So I have this loop hanging there and I have this, but it'll still help 
maintain my tension. And then I do the same thing with the other side. That loop allows you to be able to undo it easily. You could also do binder clips. Uh, if I, on like this type, well, this is wool, so it usually will kind of stay. But what I do is I leave, and sometimes what I'll do also with these, I didn't do this one. Actually, I kind of did. I like to, I prefer to leave a chevron to where I, my weaving cords are on the outside. And I will leave my weaving cords, the ones that my two ends, out of the knot. So like on this one for my diagonal, I'm going to leave the one that I was weaving with outside. It makes it easier because sometimes you'll end up undoing your, your work if you don't leave it out. And then I'm just going to do that loose little knot. Now, something else, if you are working with a lot of yarn, sometimes you may want to butterfly your ends, but sometimes that can cause them to get caught up. You just have to be very careful with yarn, especially wool, because it likes to attach itself to other wool. It really likes to do that. So periodically, you do need to comb out your ends. Uh, having a, a pick or a large tooth comb will help or just doing it with your with your hands. You want to periodically just go through and separate it and make sure that they're not stuck together because yarn really likes to do that. It also likes to entangle itself and become a big giant entangling mass. So just be careful. Macrame cord will do that too. Uh, something that I forgot to mention with macrame cord. When you're starting, you want to knot your ends. Tie an overhand knot on each end or burn them if you're a person that likes to burn them with a lighter. I am terrified of fire and do not like the smell of macrame cord that's been melted. Uh, but macrame cord will melt a little bit and so you want to do something to keep the ends from fraying because otherwise that will cause a big mess as you're weaving. So that's just a simple overhand knot. I do kind of have a request. Um... Guys and Gun does not know what an Inca Loom is. And I know that's an Inca Loom there, but like we'd like to see one. Because you saw, you you showed Inca, uh, Inca Woven Band, uh, I think, okay. beginning. So, like, so yeah. an Inca Loom, which is what this is, is another type of making a single symbol band. Uh, Inca actually just means narrow band. So technically, finger woven bands also kind of fit in that. But don't post them on the Inca loop things or ankle braiding sites because they get upset with that thing weaving. Uh, generally it uses what's called a heddle to be able to create the different sheds. The sheds are what you weave through. Uh, this is this is what's called a, a rigid heddle and you can create an ankle band with this also. Can you and what it does so we can see is it. sorry it slides up or down to raise your, raise your sheds so you can slide a shuttle through it to weave. On this type of loom, I can use the, the rigid heddle or I can use string heddles. They get attached to this rod right here. And it pulls down half of the threads and half of the threads are up. It's a little hard to show that right now because I don't have one. Well, I do have a loom set up for it, but it's on the other side of the room and I can't get to it at the moment. <laughs> But that can be another class at another time. But that's just the simple things of how you create bands like these. And I do have lots of examples of that somewhere. Okay, so we're going to go with how do you finish your weaving? There are many different ways that you can do this. And there are a lot of tutorials out there on some really fancy knots. The simple, most basic one is you just take all of your ends and you tie them in a big overhand knot. Now, some people will say, well, that's not going to hold up. I disagree because my husband, who is very, very harsh on everything, and Alona can attest to that probably, <laughs> he's a barbarian. Super harsh. Has a couple belts that I've made that... I think the oldest one is 18 years old and it's still together and it's held with an overhand knot. It's fine. It will hold up. 
One of the tricks though, for getting it to stay tight though, um, with yarn, I don't really have to do that, but with macrame cord, I will go through and I will take each cord individually and pull it taut. That helps tighten and strengthen that knot. I don't have to do that with the yarn, but with the macrame cord, if you start doing that, you will see how it will tighten and it'll be fine. Now, another way that I like to do things is alternating square knots. If you ever do hemp jewelry or the actual paracord bracelets, that should be something that you would be familiar with. The basic theory with the square knot is right over left and under, left over right and under. But we're going to do this around the all the other cords. So I have one cord that I'm going to take and I'm have a little loop off the side, but it's going over the top. My others on the other side here, I'm going to pull it under this one that's going over the top. Actually, I'm sorry, I did that right. I'm going to pull it over. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull it over the one that was on the top, and then I'm going to take it across underneath all the other cords and pull it up through the loop. And then pull that tight. Now then for the next one, this one that's on the right side, I was I went over the last time. So this time it's going to go under. And this one inside I'm going to bring it underneath that one, over the top, and then through the loop. And that's going to form the square knot. Now, if you always go from the same direction, say if the one on the right is always going over the top, then you're actually going to get a spiral forming, which if I can find my belt again, I can show that. I do like to usually start with a square knot and then have it start to spiral. So there's a couple square knots there. And then this ridge here is where it's starting to spiral that if I had more cord, it could wrap all the way around. Now finishing those, that does tend to be an issue. This one is not the strongest way. I I just took my two cords and uh, I realize I'm out of camera. There we go. Yeah, if you couldn't move your, your stuff just over a bit, it's hard for us to see. I'm trying. Okay. Um, I'm, there we go. It was hard to get this set up at all. <laughs> and I'm trying not to knock it over. Uh, I just used a square knot, but this is not the most secure way. Uh, something that I will do sometimes is take the cord that I was tying things with and one next to it, and I'll tie those together, but I don't have a lot of room, and make a knot to end things. Or another way that you can do it is you can take an external cord and tie it on and whip, uh, look up what uh, whipping the end does for a rope and you can do that. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that you can do. As I said, that simple overhand knot though, that's a good place to start and it will stay. And then if you're playing with yarn, so we're talking about fringe, this is where things can get kind of fun. I'm going to actually, I'm going to cut two of the pieces a little bit here because I don't want to do a full big thing. Okay, so you can buy fancy fringe twisters or you can just do it yourself. So I'm going to take this and I'm just gently rolling that in my hand. And I'm going to take another cord and do the same thing. Let's see, I'm trying to get, there we go. Oh, not yet. Got to be careful here. So I have these two pieces that I'm trying to twist up. And I am twisting them in the direction that the yarn twists. Because if you do the other thing, you're going to undo your yarn. So just look at what direction your yarn is going and twist that direction. Okay, so now that I've got those pretty tight and I'm going to put these two together and I'm going to let them just kind of twist up on themselves and see how they form a little rope there. 
and then I would just take the end and make a knot. And then I've got a little twisted rope. It's easier to see with these. I like to take the different colors together and twist them. But that's a simple way to make a fringe. And if you're doing a sash, that's a good way of ending things. And that's an example of a diamond in there and some chevrons here at the top. Okay, so that's what I have. Do we have questions? I can uh, stop recording and stop doing live if everyone wants to talk now. Um, yes, please. All right, so I'm going to stop recording.